Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Theology 621. This is Lecture 7b, and in this lecture we're going to look at Luke and Acts as they treat the theme of wealth and possessions. We have on the one hand a set of sort of contradictions that Luke and Acts present an uncompromising Jesus who insists, among other things, that you cannot serve God and mammon. And then we have a history of interpretation, including already uh, beginning in the book of Acts, which seems to allow at the very least some compromise with the more stringent elements of Jesus' demands vis-a-vis -vis money. And ultimately, as this picture betrays, we have a later history of Christianity, which can positively celebrate wealth as some sort of as a good thing given by God. All of this, in one measure or another, comes not only from the greed of human hearts, but also from contradictory uh, impulses in Scripture, contradictory indications. And not only is that because the Hebrew Bible tends to celebrate material prosperity as a blessing of God, but the book of Luke and Acts itself doesn't always point in exactly the same direction. I think there's a very judicious summary by Luke Timothy Johnson, who's written very fine commentaries on Luke and Acts, and in fact wrote his doctoral dissertation on the theme of possessions in Luke Acts. And Johnson sums up, although Luke consistently speaks about possessions, he does not speak about possessions consistently. And he's certainly right on the first half of that. No one gainsays that. The, the theme of possessions surfaces constantly in Luke and Acts. And he, as an author, regardless of what exactly was happening in Jesus' teaching and in the habits and conduct of the first Christians, Luke has chosen to focus on the question of how people deal with wealth, and he has included a great number of Jesus' teachings about wealth. So all sorts of material unique to Luke pertains to the question of, of, of money. But, and I think he's probably also right in the second half of this saying, not everything Luke says um, is easy, at the very least, is not easy to systematize. As if you could get done reading Luke and Acts, and you could then just summarize, all right, so what would it look like for someone who wanted to be a follower of Jesus to follow Jesus' instructions about the right use of possessions? So to begin with, let's just get some of this abundant material on, on the right use of possessions out before us. And in some ways, I want to start by focusing on what we could sort of categorize as the more demanding aspects and, and an emphasis on uh, Luke's priority that, that God has come in Christ to bring good news to the poor. We can see this sort of theme already beginning in the birth narrative. So for someone with a good knowledge of the scriptures, when they read something like Mary and Joseph bringing Jesus uh, to present him for their, for their purification at the time of Jesus' circumcision, it says they offered the sacrifice according to what is stated in the law. If you know your scripture well, you already see a little indication about the financial uh, status of the Holy Family. Why? Because the offering they present a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons, is prescribed in Leviticus as the offering for a poor person who, although they're supposed to be offering a lamb, is given an alternative. If they are poor, if she is poor, she can offer a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So already in subtle ways in the birth narrative, Luke is presenting something about his interest, at least, in wealth. And noting that Jesus is born of a family who can't offer the, the official uh, proper sacrifice. There's, of course, less subtle things in the birth narrative, and these would include things like Mary's Magnificat, where, in a very unsubtle way, as she praises God, she says, God has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. In my country, if someone talks like that, they're accused of inciting class warfare. And uh, here we have it in Mary's Magnificat, apropos of the promises about her son. Now, what is interesting is that we will find her son talking about precisely those things. Think about the fact that in Luke, in a unique scene in Luke, that is Jesus' sermon in a synagogue in 
Capernaum, he picks as the topic for this first sermon, in a sense, his inaugural address, he picks the passage from Isaiah the prophet, where it says, and here we quote, the, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. If we just full stop there, that's really kind of amazing. Of all the passages that Jesus could begin with, he says, this is what I'm here for. And I am the Christ, the anointed one, because God has anointed me for this purpose. This is my mission. I'm also here to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free. And he adds another phrase, which also has Old Testament resonance, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is a way of speaking about the statutes for the year of Jubilee. And the year of Jubilee was an Old Testament statute that said that not only in the seventh year, every seventh year, people were supposed to remit debts. And every seven times seven, every 50th year, 49th turning into the 50th, the Jubilee year, you proclaim a, a, a year of liberty throughout the land. It shall be a Jubilee for you. And this is a year where people return to their ancestral property. And in a sense, you reset all the ledgers. Part of the purpose of this sort of ordinance was to prevent people from falling into hopeless stages of poverty where they were indebted to the point that they couldn't recover because their family owed other families and so that even when a child is born, there's no way for them to dig out. Uh, Leviticus, foreseeing such a problem, says, look, periodically we're just going to hit the reset button and everyone starts again. Jesus comes and in this inaugural address says, Good news for the poor, guess what? It's Jubilee year, we're starting again. We could go on and we won't belabor, you know, we won't make too much of some of these things because their basic meaning is quite straightforward. The question is, what does Luke think it all means? So let's just keep looking at some passages. The Sermon on the Mount, which in Luke is a sermon on a level plane, whereas in Matthew, and Matthew's more famous words, we have blessed are you who are poor in spirit. Blessed are you who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Matthew presents those words as inner dispositions, someone who is hungry for righteousness. Luke is just talking about people who are hungry and people who are poor. And in case the point got missed, Luke, unlike Matthew, includes woes. So blessed are you, congratulations, good news to you who are poor. You won the lottery. You're going to get the kingdom. Woe to you who are rich. You've gotten all the consolation you're going to get. Woe to you who are full now. You will be hungry. As if to explicate this sort of, I don't know, dichotomy based on material possessions, we later get a remarkable parable in Luke, which we'll look at a little bit more later, popularly known now as the story of Dives and Lazarus. Dives is the Latin form, well, the Latin word for rich man. So this is just the story of the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man is not named, Lazarus is. In the story of the rich man and Lazarus, rich man dies, he's being tormented, and he can see Lazarus, his old servant, uh, in Abraham's bosom. And Abraham says, child, uh, so sorry, D Dives asks for some sort of mercy. Could I just get a little bit of cool water? I'm in torment here. And Abraham here is quite uncompromising. Abraham says, child, remember that during your lifetime, you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner evil things. Now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. This looks like Jesus telling a parable that unpacks what he meant back in Luke 6, where he says, Woe to you rich, you've received your consolation. Here he tells a parable and he says, guess what? After death, the rich people will be in torment and they will be told when they beg for mercy, you already got your mercy. You got it in your life with your full bellies and your comfort. Now it's time for you to have torment and for the poor who had nothing to be comforted. A, a brief comment to, to contextualize this parable of Jesus. Some of his thinking there would have been sort of not totally unremarkable, uh, not totally unexpected to kind of thoughtful pagans of the day and also to thoughtful Jews of the day. Uh, but thoughtful pagans of the day, I'll give an example of 
Lucian, the satirist from the second century, who I think I've praised before in this series. He's very funny, very witty, sort of sardonic and cynical, especially cynical about religion. But even Lucian, as cynical as he is about religion, he, he writes a dialogue called the Menippus, where they, they get a tour of the underworld. And in these visions of the underworld, who does he see there but sinners being tormented, they're chained up, and the sinners include tax collectors, adulterers, pimps, and above all, rich people. And in this story, Lucian's Menippus, the rich people are really getting it bad. And it's like Lucian saying, well, duh, we know, we know who the really bad people are and who deserve to get it in the next life or in the underworld, as it is in his case. We're going to move along through the book of Luke and Acts, um, just noticing the sort of uncompromising stance about wealth. Here we'll just sort of rally off. Jesus says, you cannot serve God and mammon. There's a choice. Mammon is the Aramaic word for money. So you either choose God or money, and you will hate the other. Pick your master. Sell your possessions and give alms. Make purses for yourselves that do not wear out. An unfailing treasure in heaven, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. Sell your possessions. None of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. That sounds pretty serious. Did the disciples take it seriously? Peter said, Lord, look, we've left our homes and followed you. Jesus says, good, that's what I told you to do. Jesus goes on with the uncompromising teaching. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. This saying has been subject to any number of sort of mollifying interpretations. Why? Because it seems too hard. Indeed, what do the, what do the people who first hear it say? Well, that's crazy. Who can be saved? First, just to dispense with some sort of make-believe interpretations, you'll occasionally hear it said like that this whole business about the camel of a needle, the, the, the eye of a needle was the name of a gate and a camel could get through it. It kind of bent down, but it was hard. There's no evidence for any of this anywhere. Uh, Jesus was deliberately using an absurd image to say it is impossible, which is clear given what he says next. And, People react and say, that sounds impossible. And he doesn't say, oh, well, actually, I just meant, you know, if the camel tries real hard, it can get through. He says, yeah, it is impossible. But what's impossible for mortals is possible for God. And that's important. And I think if we have that saying, we want to sort of say, again, Luke or Jesus, how do you mean that? Do you mean to say that rich people can be saved because God is incomprehensibly merciful and can save them even as rich people? Or, Jesus and Luke, do you mean to say that it's even possible for God to transform the nasty rich people who deserve to be in torment, like Dives in the Lazarus and Dives story, that, that you can transform some of them so that they do the right thing and thereby get saved. And what's the point of saying it's possible for God? Well, it's noteworthy in this case that the very the parable that comes, or the story that comes on the heels of that saying is another story unique to Luke. This is Luke 19, 1 to 10, the story of Zacchaeus. And in the Zacchaeus story, Jesus comes to town. There's a wee little man named Zacchaeus. He climbs up a sycamore tree to see the Lord. He says, Zacchaeus, I'm staying with you. And again, just so we get the historical context, everyone grumbles and says, why are you going to stay with that guy? He's a tax gatherer. He's rich. He's wicked. And the denouement of the story is that Zacchaeus says to the Lord, look, half of my possessions I will give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone, and we supply here, of course you have, I will pay them back four times as much. And Jesus said to them, Today salvation has come to this house. He too is a son of Abraham. The Son of Man came to seek and save what was lost. Now, I would submit that <laughs> that's a very interesting story. I think it probably offers commentary on the saying just before it. Who can be saved? Can a rich man be saved? And Jesus says, 
it is possible with God. Why is it possible with God? Because things like the Zacchaeus episode sometimes happen. In other words, when Jesus says sometimes things are impossible, what is impossible for mortals is possible with God. He doesn't mean to say God will just uh, wave aside the injustices and save the rich as they are. He means things like Zacchaeus will happen sometimes because God has the power to make them happen. If we continue on to the book of Acts, we get these sort of strikingly almost communistic sounding sayings. All were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all, as any had need. From each according to his ability, to each according to his need. No one claimed private ownership of any possession, but, they, but everything they owned was held in common. What are we hearing here? Are we hearing the words of Jesus and the disciples, or are we hearing a description of the Communist Party? Well, in fact, I've cheated because one of those sayings is a saying of Karl Marx for each, from each according to his ability to each according to his need. That actually comes from Karl Marx. But the other two sayings do come from the book of Acts and describe the disciples. It's not an accident that that sounds a lot like communism. In fact, that is, if we had nothing else, that is the definition of communism. No one had any private property. All things were held in common. And just to play this game a little bit longer, but I won't do it forever. Notice the next story in the book of Acts. Ananias and Sapphira sold a piece of property and held back some of the proceeds. So they don't play by the rules. They only brought a part of the proceeds of their private property, and they laid it at the apostles' feet. What happened? The Holy Spirit killed them both. Ananias died and Sapphira died. And the result of that was that a great fear gripped everyone. Well, some of this just makes me think of the 1930s and a great terror spreading to the ordinary people. Why? Because death gripped all the people. And here we quote Stalin, death solves all problems. No man, no problem. All right, I'm not trying to uh, say that the Book of Acts is depicting a Stalinist purge, but it is amazing that the two property holders that we're told about who do not share all their property are dead by the end of the fifth chapter of the book of Acts. If we just take a breath here and say, all right, so Jesus insists, you can't serve God in money. You have to sell all your possessions. No rich person can be saved. Why, why is there any controversy? Well, a lot of early Christians would kind of ask the same question. And so, not only in the first five chapters of the book of Acts, but for centuries, we find people, and they can be individuals like St. Anthony, who take this seriously. St. Anthony, whose biography was a bestseller in the ancient world, and who was as close in the ancient world to something like a, a superstar. People traveled from around the world to see him because of his holiness. Anthony was walking past a church and happened to hear the gospel reading of that day and the words wafted out of the church, sell your possessions and come and follow me. And Anthony did it and became in a sense the father of the ascetical movement where people did give up their possessions. Monastic communities in a more orderly way continued to live uh, with full of monks or, or cloistered virgins, nuns who had none of their own possessions. And those are basically what we would call um, orthodox. They played nice with the church, with the organized church. But there were also heretical movements that basically said all of Christianity is compromised. So a heretical movement called the Apostolici said we want to be like the apostles. And that means we will not have private property. And anyone who has private property has simply adulterated the pure uh, gospel of our Lord. This freaked out people like Augustine and other church fathers who wrote against the apostolic key. But you can see the issue. There's a clear theme in Luke. There's a clear theme in Jesus' ministry. And there are people who seem to follow that uh, firmly. So what are we missing in Luke? Is there, is there any uh, legitimacy or, I don't know, integrity to the position that we will find espoused by 
by what we could call orthodox Christendom, lower case O, that it is okay to have private property. Well, here we want to go back through the Gospel of Luke and note that, as Luke Timothy Johnson said, although Luke speaks constantly about possessions, Luke doesn't speak about possessions, sorry, Luke speaks consistently about possessions, Luke doesn't speak about possessions consistently. Why does he say that? What are the other indications we get in Luke Acts? We can almost work backward from this question by looking at a quotation of Thomas Aquinas, just to pick a sort of representative official teacher of mainstream Christianity, who says that the heresy of the apostolic key does not lie in taking the vows of chastity and poverty. After all, monks and numerous clerics do the same. The error lies in wanting to impose the same discipline on all the faithful under pain of condemnation. It's therefore an error to say it's not permitted for a man to possess private property. This is a valid point, and it actually picks at something in the Gospel of Luke itself, namely that Luke and other early Christians are aware that not everything Jesus says in the Gospels applies to everyone. The classic example of a one-off commandment would be something like, go find a colt, untie it, bring it here. That's the saying of the Lord, but followers of Jesus have never felt that they were being commanded by their Lord to obey those instructions. Likewise, cryptic things that he says to his disciples, the one who has no sword must sell his cloak and buy one. Is that an everlasting piece of instructions to all would-be followers? Well, Luke is aware of this sort of problem. After one parable, the disciples, actually in this case Peter says, Lord, are you saying this parable to us or to everybody? And in a sense, Luke really gives us the best chance to see an early Christian wrestle with this question of what were historically delimited instructions that Jesus gave to his followers and what were perhaps one-off uh, spiritual challenges that he gave to this or that rich man um, and what were timeless, enduring instructions and ethics that Jesus and his followers expected to be carried out generation after generation. Because Luke gives us the story of the early church and lets us get a glimpse into what he thinks it looked like for them to be more or less faithful in carrying out those instructions. So let's go back through Luke and Acts and just note that Despite the considerable evidence that Jesus is basically just saying, no money, if you want to be my follower, that's that, let's get on with it. There are these other indications, and we'll just note a few, because I don't think this needs to be belabored. One would be the fact that already John the Baptist, when he's preaching, and John's like Mr. Fire and Brimstone, but notice what he says to the tax collectors and soldiers. How do you want to repent and escape the coming judgment? will collect no more than the amount prescribed. And what does he say to the soldiers? Don't extort money. Be satisfied with your wages. This may seem like a strange thing to fix upon, but I just noticed that John doesn't say, get rid of everything. In fact, these are people engaged in really what are questionable lines of work. And John says, in effect, just be a fair tax gatherer or just be a soldier as fair as a soldier can be. Soldiers almost by definition aren't doing the best line of work in, in, in John's day. Certainly tax gatherers are not. And yet John seems to think there is an ambit of salvation for people who are just by those standards. Likewise within Jesus in te teaching and, and ministry, I think one important thing is to see that the disciples have given up their houses and their possessions. But there are other disciples and followers who are funding Jesus' ministry. So an important passage, and an important one because it features women prominently, Jesus is going through the cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom, and the twelve are with him, as well as some women who provided for them out of their resources. That's mentioned almost in passing, but it does answer a precious question. How did these guys, who was writing the checks for this ministry? It's, it's a lot easier for uh, Peter and James and John to leave all they have, provided that these relatively well-off women keep sending funds 
And those women did not become poor. They are still wealthy enough to be funding this ministry, which means that the fact that they're included as followers indicates Jesus has some category for people who do have possessions, provided they use possessions in a just way. This theme shows up, and perhaps is even the predominant theme, with the question of giving alms, which again, to give alms isn't an, a non-trivial act of charity, but it's not the same as selling all your possessions. And so repeatedly, Jesus' demand of people is to give alms. Even in Luke 19, the story of Zacchaeus, it's not clear that Zacchaeus has become a mendicant following around with nothing. Zacchaeus has simply been a businessman who had been a rather unethical businessman who set things right. And Jesus says, good enough, salvation has come to this house. Alms feature very prominently in the book of Acts. So Tabitha's almsgiving is mentioned. And in a really pivotal scene where, where Luke tries to grapple with how it was that God grafted Gentiles into the movement, a, a constant feature of Cornelius' depiction is the fact that his alms have ascended before God. And because he was an almsgiver, he was acceptable. Likewise, we get the impression that in the book of Acts, after chapter 5, when Luke is kind of hit, checked off, that yes, they had all things in common in Jerusalem, from then on, you get the impression that people have their own stuff, and they're very generous with it, and they come to one another's needs, but you don't get the impression in the rest of the book of Acts, that is, 23 chapters of Acts, a big old narrative, you don't get the impression that everywhere the gospel arrived, everyone sold everything they had and left their houses and left their goods. All of that is to say, in Luke's mind, doesn't mean Luke's right, but in Luke's mind, he is comfortable recording all of Jesus' very radical demands and harsh statements about sending the rich away empty, and he's comfortable narrating a history of Jesus' followers, which Luke thinks is a faithful history, where they're basically getting it right and they're being guided by the power of the Holy Spirit. And in that faithful history, that faithful history is compatible with people having private property. So long as they give alms, so long as they are generous with it when need arises. All of this may sound very uh, mealy-mouthed and obvious, but I want to emphasize it partly so that we can draw attention to how much radical material Luke does preserve. What I want to do now is note one important theme for Luke and X vis-a-vis -vis wealth and possessions, and then look at one of the most bizarre passages in a little more detail. First, a theme. One thing that Luke wants to demonstrate is that the right use of possessions and being a good listener to scripture, to the law and the prophets, this is one of the themes that's dear to Luke. We can see this in ways obvious and less obvious, but for instance, note that when Jesus is talking about good news for the poor, he frames that in terms of what the prophet Isaiah said, and even the prophet Isaiah there is already referring to a commandment from the book of Leviticus. Likewise, one way of understanding the story of uh, Lazarus and Dives is that from Jesus' perspective, it's not simply the case that there's post-mortem reversal, and people who had stuff get punished, and people who didn't have stuff get uh, comforted. But notice what he says. Abe, uh, the, this rich man is saying, please go tell my brothers so they don't end up in this place of torment. And Abraham, the character in the parable, says, they have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. That is to say, if you had listened to Moses and the prophets, you wouldn't be here right now because you would have conducted yourself different in your lifetime. And we can see that this rich man dives is not merely a rich man, he's a corrupt dude, because even in this post-mortem existence, he wants to issue commands, Lazarus, come bring me a cup of cool water. And he still thinks he's the boss, he's the one who hasn't listened to Moses and the prophets. I think we see in Luke 16, 
a, a very remarkable sort of uh, middle of out of middle of nowhere in Luke 16 we get the story of the unrighteous steward which we're going to talk about in a minute that's all about money then we get uh, the story of Lazarus and dies is all about money and right in the middle of it we get this comment that the Pharisees who were lovers of money heard this and ridiculed Jesus and then Luke says the law and the prophets are until John and then he goes on with more parables about money why insert the law and the prophets are until John in Luke 16 in the middle of a chapter entirely devoted to the treatment of right use of wealth? Well, I don't actually have an answer for that. No one has a great answer for that. But it coheres with Luke's belief that right use of wealth and right use of understanding of the law are related. And the fact that the Pharisees, who are supposedly these strict interpreters of the law, Luke adds this jab, they are lovers of money. Finally, just notice that when, when Luke gets to depicting things as they ought to be, that is, in this, these halcyon early days in Jerusalem of the community of believers gathered, he's, he, he uses this unique word for a needy person. So not only is he presenting uh, the classical ideal, and this, by the way, is an ideal all the way back to the Pythagoreans. This is, this is half a millennium old or older that friends have all things in common. But he uses a word that's used nowhere else in the New Testament when he says that there wasn't a needy person among them. And that word happens to be something from the book of Deuteronomy in the Septuagint. There will be no needy person among you. This is one of the promises in the law. That surely is Luke's way of saying, do you see this community in Jerusalem? We are Im embodying what things were supposed to look like. Whereas the Pharisees wanted money and wouldn't listen to the law, whereas people like Dives wouldn't listen to the law, we are. We're getting it right. This is what it looks like to get it right. This is an important theme for Luke, and it might go some way to unpacking you know, one of the, the harder to understand episodes with the so-called rich young ruler. This guy says, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, you know the commandments. You don't commit adultery, you don't murder, you don't steal, you don't bear false witness, you honor your mother and father. Just ten commandments. Come on, mate. You know, this is a silly question. What do you mean what I have to do in inherit eternal life? Well, the guy's embarrassed because he's asked, he's really trying to ask Jesus, what do you think the most important commandment is? Jesus doesn't play ball and just says, dude, quit trying to play tricks. So the guy's embarrassed and he says, I've kept all these from my youth. Now here Jesus says there's still one thing lacking. Sell all that you own and distribute the money to the poor. That's liable to a couple interpretations. And one interpretation, we won't try to adjudicate between them, but one interpretation is that he was actually wrong when he said, I've kept all these from my youth. That in fact, in fact one of the earliest comments we have on this passage, says he lied when he said he had kept the commandments. Because since he did love wealth, he hadn't fully kept the commandment to love his neighbor as himself. So it's possible to understand Jesus' command here not as actually adding something to the law, but as Jesus calling him, calling him on his own self-deception and saying, no, you don't really love your neighbor as yourself because you've put your own money first. So for you, not necessarily for everyone, for you, your wealth is an idol and you cannot serve God and mammon. You have to sell all you have. That's one line of interpretation, again, not the only one. We want to look at a little more detail now at one of the most notorious instances in the Gospel of Luke of treating the question of possessions, and that is the so-called parable of the unrighteous steward. This is in Luke 16, a chapter devoted to money, and this has been a thorn in the side of Christian interpreters almost from the get-go. You will soon see why. Jesus tells the disciples a story. There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to the rich man that this manager was squandering his property. Already we want to ask, are we to imagine these are true charges? And are we whom, with whom are we to identify in this story? We'll keep reading. So the rich man summoned him and said, what is this that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management because you cannot be my manager any longer. And the manager said to himself, what will I do now that my master is taking my job away? 
I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. In other words, I have no other, other employment opportunities. So I've decided what to do so that when I lose my job, people may welcome me into their homes. Notice the manager's motivation here. He is not trying to set something right, at least ostensibly. He's trying to take care of his own future, which is looking bleak at the moment. And we need to ask, is what he does what makes him dishonest? He summons his master's debtors one at a time and says, what do you owe my master? A hundred jugs of oil. Uh, well, let's call it 50. He summons someone else. How much do you owe? A hundred containers of wheat. Tell you what, let's say you owe him 80. So we can see how he's making friends and how he's going to maybe have someone to receive him into their home, as it says. But then comes a real surprise. How would we expect the master to react to this series of events? We'd expect him to be furious. He was already going to fire the guy, and now the guy's been ruining his accounts. Instead, the master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. Why would the master think this was shrewd? And the parable goes on, and here is where it's troubled Christian interpreters, because Jesus seems to uphold this sort of conduct as a model to be emulated. The children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous mammon, so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into eternal homes. One question we have to ask is, where does the parable end and Jesus' commentary begin? At the very least, Jesus says, you should rip people off the way this guy did, or you should do something the way this guy did. The starkest way of framing the problem, it can be represented by C.C. Torrey, who says, look, it sure seems like Jesus approves a program of canny self-interest, recommending to his disciples a standard of life which is inferior. I tell you what, gain friends by means of money. That already seems kind of ugly enough. But this isn't the worst of it. He bases the teaching on the story of a shrewd scoundrel who feathered his own nest at the expense of a man who had trusted him, and then appears to say to his disciples, let this be your model. Well, is that what's going on in this story? Tori doesn't think so. Others don't think so. There are certainly some... Uh, uncertain elements of the story. And let's look at a couple. One is, as I alluded to, it's not clear when the parable proper ends and Jesus' commentary on it begins. Partly this is because in, in Greek, of course, there are no quotation marks, so you can't uh, with punctuation signal the end of quotation. But more than that, the, the phrase that is here translated, his master, the character in the parable, is just in Greek, hakurios. And hakurios is also the Greek expression for the Lord. And so here we could, we could either render, his master commended the dishonest manager, or we could say, the Lord commended the dishonest manager for having acted shrewdly. This doesn't really change the ethics of the story, but it does change how we should imagine the events within the parable transpiring. Are we looking for some sort of rationale whereby a manager might say, well done, pal, that was clever? Or are we just looking for the Lord to reflect, Jesus to reflect on this parable and say, that actually was, uh, is, a, is a lesson that you all can emulate? In my opinion, wherever we conclude that the parable proper ends, one way or another, Jesus definitely does uphold uh, the conduct of the shrewd manager because he goes on to say in verse nine, you too should make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous mammon. That is, he, he says you should do exactly what this guy did. And he almost shames them. And he says, look, if, if the children of this age, he argues from lesser to greater, if the children of this age can be this clever to save their own skins when they're going to lose their job, surely you should be more clever than that and should similarly use money to achieve more important ends. We want to look at a few other details here. If it is the master of the parable doing the praising here, 
why would he commend his steward? Is he commending the dishonest manager that is dishonest in this very moment for scamming the master by changing the bills? Or is he commending this guy whom we're labeling the dishonest manager because already at the beginning of the, in, of the parable, we've been told that he was squandering his master's goods? Those are two possibilities. Relatedly, how do we understand the valence of shrewd? Shrewd has a slightly pejorative tone in English. It sounds like crafty, a little bit mischievous, showing some, some, some gray matter, but not necessarily particularly ethical. And I think that's a prejudicial translation. Uh, the, the Greek adjective that's rendered shrewd is just phronimos, and that in almost every other passage in the New Testament is something good, including at Luke's hands. Um, phronimos is, is someone prudent, and Jesus tells parables where he wants his disciples to be phronimos, prudent, sensible, wise. So I don't think shrewd, I think it, it, it colors our, our reading unnecessarily. We haven't answered these questions yet. I want to raise a couple others that, that might go toward explaining why the master might commend uh, the dishonest manager. And one of the proposals attends to the details of how the bills are changed. So 100 jugs of oil become 50, and 100 containers of wheat become 80. It's possible that the manager is doing nothing more than just doing people a favor in order to make friends. Personally, actually, I think that's the simplest explanation. But it's also possible that the manager has been cheating the debtors all along. And so whereas in truth they only owe 50 and 80, he has been adding on graft. He's been saying, you've got to pay me this much extra. In that case, what he would be doing is simply eliminating his own, uh, his own share. And in that case, he would be ingratiating them to his master and ingratiating himself to them. But the problem with this is that one, it won't really explain why he's being praised as why he's being called unrighteous, because he'd actually be doing the right thing, finally. More importantly, when he goes to these people, the bill they owe is the bill to his master, not to him. And I think, here's a, this gives us an entree into a, a kind of ingenious proposal for what's going on here. And that is that what he is eliminating is the interest added on to their loan. And let me explain this. According to Torah, it is forbidden to loan uh, foodstuffs at interest. So if peasants say we need 50 barrels of oil or 50 containers of oil, you cannot loan that and demand interest according to Jewish law. Because people are people and want to make interest, the way people got around the law is that they wrote the IOU, they wrote the bill as if it included the interest. So if a rich man loaned the poor man 50 containers of oil, they wrote the bill to say, you owe me 100. And if he loaned them 80 uh, bushels of wheat, he wrote the bill to say, you owe me 100. So the interest is actually snuck into the bill. If that's what's happening in this scenario, then what the manager is doing is quite clever. He's going to the peasants and saying, let's get rid of the illegal interest. What would happen then is, what is the, what is the master supposed to do? What is the rich man supposed to do? He can't very well come and prosecute the case in public because to do so, he would have to admit that he'd been violating Torah all along. And in this scenario, we could imagine that the, the master is supposed to be saying, you clever servant, you clever, you clever manager, you really put me in a bind. The peasants now are delighted with me because when the rich man shows up, the peasants say, oh, thank you for being gracious and wiping away half of our debt. And I now have to keep you in my employment because you've resolved this problem and I can't very well prosecute you or prosecute them because to do so, I would expose myself as a violator of the law. That's an ingenious proposal. This is by a scholar named Dennett. But I think it actually probably presses too hard. And a simpler explanation lies to hand, which is that 
Jesus is telling a deliberately outrageous parable, and he's simply working from the lesser to the greater and saying, folks, in day-to-day -day life, when people are in a pinch, they know what to do to use money to get themselves, let's say, a couch to crash on. They make friends by means of money. And he says to his followers, you better be at least that clever. Money is a means to an end, and the greater end is eternal life. And therefore, the fact that the mechanics of the parable entail some unrighteous and, or sneaky behavior, I don't know that that's supposed to be that big a deal. It's supposed to simply say, wake up. Uh, you better be on your toes about how to use money because there's a lot more at stake than just losing your job. Needless to say, time doesn't permit us to look at every passage that touches on money in Luke and Acts with the same detail. But as you continue to read these books, keep your eyes open, especially for how the theme is treated in the book of Acts. Because Luke has been pretty uncompromising in including all of Jesus' most demanding teachings, and including some that aren't found in the other Gospels. So it's interesting to see what he thinks faithful uh, carrying out of those commandments is, because we get to see that as he depicts the early Christians at work in the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, after chapter 5, the theme of money largely fades away. It doesn't totally disappear. And so please read carefully because you'll see little elements of it surface. And I think actually those, those little elements, those little comments about alms, about Paul even coming to Jerusalem with alms for his people, these are supposed to be revealing, these can be revealing for what Luke thinks um, a faithful follower of Jesus using money the right way is supposed to look like.